I just wanted to focus very briefly on looking at the carer um, because in the transplant process um, we sort of do take a lot of focus on the patient. Um, we talk about what's going to happen to them um, and they've got nurses and a lot of people looking after them but sometimes there's this dedicated carer that's looking after the patient and we also need to look after them as well. And the carer is really responsible for making the arrangements. Um, I do have a friend who, I think it's over 20 years ago now, when she actually got diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And she was actually the principal person. She did everything um, and ran the household. But the minute she actually got diagnosed with that lymphoma, she did that change focus and she thought, I'm not gonna deal with any of this anymore. So the poor carer or the husband actually had to pick up all of those things that the, the patient doesn't wanna look after. And sometimes that will stay the, that for the whole time. They might say, I don't want to deal with that anymore. I've, I've had cancer. I don't have to look after the bills. I'm going to leave that with you. <laughs> there can be some role changes that occur and the carer can take on responsibilities that they've never had. And those responsibilities can be with them long term into the future until that person might want to take them back. They're the person that's giving a lot of emotional support um, and they're having to read what the patient is going through, what they're thinking. Um, and sometimes they can be a bit surprised at how the person is re reacting to the treatment and how they're talking to people. But we need to understand that none of us know what we're going to, to do when we're going through a transplant um, and that those um, reactions are acceptable and that we just have to manage those symptoms. The other thing that they do is they sometimes need to provide the physical care um, to the person when they get home and they're having to actually look after them, shower them, um, helping them get changed. They're also looking after the home environment and maintaining things ticking over, getting groceries, doing the shopping, um, doing all of those things. And also when the patient gets really sick, they're also the advocate for the patient um, and they're really sort of speaking up to make sure that the patient is heard um, because they're really the best person to know what the person is going through and what they're thinking. However, we also need to look at taking care of the carer. Um, mm -hmm. And a key thing, um, I think one of the downsides to hospitals today in the 21st century is that they say that visiting hours can be 24 hours on a haematology oncology unit. Might be a good thing, but I also think it's a bad thing. I always sort of say as couples or as adults, we never live in each other's pockets 24 seven. We go off to work by ourselves. Um, we do things um, separately by ourselves. We go off and you know, meet with our friends. Um, we do things differently. So we don't have to live in each other's pockets just because someone's gotten sick. So the carer needs to also be able to say, I can step back. Someone else can look after the person who's sick at the moment while I go off and have some downtime myself. So it's listening to your friends. It's knowing your limits. It's know when to let go. It's know when to scream and say, I've had enough. I need some help here. Um, hospitals are very busy. Nursing staff, you know, is quite tight sometimes. So nurses do rely on carers to do some of the things that nursing nurses should be doing. So sometimes it's, it's actually speaking up and saying, okay, I'm gonna be away for a couple of hours, but I wanna make sure that you're going to be looking after, um, you know, my husband, my, my sister, my brother, whoever it is, that person that's going through the, the treatment. Um, for those who are um, living here in Brisbane, it's very hard when you're already um, being sort of relocated from a remote area um, and living at the Leukaemia Foundation here. But it's also trying to have a role outside the life of looking after the person who's sick. And it's having that private time and just doing things by yourself. If you can, it's building a team of carers. Um, we don't expect one person to do absolutely everything for the patient. Um, it's trying to find some other members within the family who can also take on those, those responsibilities and those roles. It's having a sense of humour. Um, and I always find it quite surprising when people sort of come onto an oncology ward, I think they expect doom and gloom. But in actual fact, even staff, we laugh and we have fun. Um, I think if we don't laugh, we'll probably all end up crying and really life's, not, life's too short and it's not worth crying. Um, so it's really keeping that sense of humour th going through a transplant um, and laughing at some of the situations that you can get yourselves into thinking, you know, I never thought I'd ever be doing something like this sort of thing. So that you try and find that, that humorous side to what's going on. For the carer, it's also appreciate, pr appreciating what you do. Um, 
and I think carers do a lot um, and I don't think they're valued or acknowledged as much as they should be sort of thing. So I guess this, this is my opportunity to say thank you to all those carers um, and for the role that they play. But it's really important to seek help when you need it. Um, and the Leukaemia Foundation does have the Caring for the Carer program, um, which is great. And they've also got all of the support people that the carer can actually tap into so they can have that bit of downtime and have a shoulder to cry on um, or that sounding board to talk to someone about the problems that they're going through. So I just wanted to finish off by um, with these couple of slides um, with regards to looking ahead. And I think one of the key things um, in the 21st century is that we don't, we're not very good at relaxing and we're not very good at enjoying the simple things of life. So I've got these two pictures here of really we need to take that time and just sit and look at the scenery, um, smell the roses and we need to enjoy <coughs> the food that we eat and for people who've gone through a transplant process that can actually be quite um, an enjoyable process is just starting to enjoy um, eating and drinking the things that you normally like. But it's also finding that balance um, and it's that balance of having the right amount of exercise, rest and diet. Um, and this is a picture that I had a number of years ago, but I think cats always have the good life. They know exactly how much sleeping, how much eating and how much exercise to do. Um, and I think wherever we choose to snooze, it will be a good time. And it's something that we really do need to put in, into part of that transplant process. So just in summary, um, key thing around stem cell, autologous stem cell transplant is that we must collect those stem cells first. It is a three to four month process for the transplant. It can be a life changing event and some people can really change how they live life. You need to be kind to yourself um, and with that I mean you really look at what do I do after that transplant and have some downtime and enjoy that, that time of being together again and that we do need to take care of the carer um, and we need to acknowledge the role that they um, have in the transplant process. So I shall leave it there um, and open it up for any questions.